Well, it's been said that everyone has their price. So what that means is that potentially, if I was to give you enough money, I could get you to do something immoral or illegal. Do you think that could happen? I won't ask you to put up your hands. So maybe you're gonna say, Justin, well, it depends exactly what you've asked me to do. Like, I'm, I, may, I may do a million dollars for you know, eating a slug, but something else, maybe not. For a million bucks, would you be willing to play Russian roulette with a revolver? For a million dollars, would you be prepared to give up the last 10 years of your natural life? Well, in an online survey, 2,000 people were asked what they would do for a million dollars, and 8% said they'd have a limb amputated, 21% said they'd get a tattoo across their forehead, 31% said they'd swim in a tank of sharks, 38% said they would put their pet to sleep. So, I'm glad to hear those, oh, those the eight o'clock was silent, so I don't think any of them love their pets whatsoever, but 34% said they'd change religions. And then this one was very strange. 1%, only 1% said they would have their tongue removed. So I don't know what's so attractive about the tongue that nobody wants to get rid of that, but be that as it may. Now you might say, Justin, I don't think that's me. I mean, I'm not gonna sell out my soul. I know what my values are, I know what my principles are. I'm a Christian, I don't think any amount of money would, would cause me to compromise. But then can I remind you of the Apostle Peter? Wasn't he presumptuous? Wasn't he quite arrogant when he said, Lord, even though everyone else will abandon you, even if they do, Lord, I, I'm prepared to die for you. I, I, I'm in, Lord, I'm, I'm going all the way to the cross. And just a moment later, Peter's outside weeping bitterly, which reminds us of the arrogance of presumption that as the scriptures say, pride comes before a fall. Or we'll take for example, uh, the reality show slash documentary that I think is still on Netflix, it's called The Push. Anyone seen The Push by Darren Brown? Don't think anyone. It's quite a, quite a harrowing thing to watch because Darren Brown is a self-dubbed psychological illusionist and he's done lots of these shows over the years and so on. And what the push is, is there's an unsuspecting contestant, if we can call him that, who's taken into an entirely fabricated scenario with 70 actors. And slowly, this guy is manipulated to do little things until he finds himself enmeshed on this particular evening at this uh, charity function in all sorts of lies. Darren Brown is kind of like behind uh, closed doors. He's got his whole team and he's got cameras watching everything and he's kind of communicating with actors. And this is what Darren Brown says. The question we're asking is simple. Can we be manipulated through social pressure to commit murder? And so you see this guy, I think his name was Chris. You see him just starting to stress and it starts small and they're just asking more and more. And it's just, as you watch it, you realize this is how sin works. This is how temptation works. And then Darren Brown says he has one goal. I need Chris to feel like there's only one way out when he's told to commit murder. Can social compliance be used to make someone push a living, breathing human being to their death? So I'm not going to give you the ending, but I encourage you, if you do want to watch it, it it's kind of a strange thing to watch because it actually feels very unethical to realize that this poor guy doesn't know what's going on. And, and um, yeah, there certainly is potential there. So I want us to begin a two-part series this Sunday and next week that I've entitled Hooked, The Lure of Temptation. And you may remember end of November last year, I preached a two-part series from Genesis 3, which we called Lies That Ruined the World. So I'm kind of picking up on a similar theme. I think a good definition of temptation is that it's an invitation. Temptation is an invitation. It's an invitation, though, not to something good, but to something bad. It's an invitation to abandon God's will, to turn our backs on God's word and what he says, and temptation, like it did with this guy, Chris, in the push, pressurizes you kind of repeatedly until you make this choice. Am I going to stay faithful to God 
or am I going to go and have this affair with sin? Now, let me issue this disclaimer, and we can't spend much time on this, but it's not a sin to be tempted. That's important to say up front. It's not a sin to face temptation, to feel that pull. It's the succumbing or the giving into the temptation that births the sin. And if you just think about the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 4, he's in the wilderness. The tempter comes to him. Christ is hungry. That's a natural desire after fasting for so long. Satan comes and says, turn these stones into bread. Now, Christ resists that. He knows that Satan wants him to take a shortcut to the cross. Uh, sorry, a, a shortcut to fame and glory without the cross. And yet he stands against Satan. And so Christ didn't sin in that. Temptation isn't sin until you've given in. So I want us to read this morning James chapter 1. And we're going to spend our time over the next two weeks in kind of the last few verses that I'm going to read. But let me just read verses 2 to 4 as part of the context. James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then jumping down to verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. Now there's something very confusing going on here in the English translation. And so unless you know Greek, you won't know what's going on. But in the first part of the chapter, James speaks of trials, trials, trials. And then he comes to verse 12, which is kind of like the hinge, joining these two sections together. And after verse 12, he then speaks of temptation, temptation, temptation. So what's interesting about this? Well, the word for temptation is pyrasmos. The word for trials is pyrasmos. They are the exact same Greek word. So how do we know how to translate it? Well, we've got to look at the context. This is a word that has different nuances, and in some contexts it means trials and some in temptation. So what do we see here? Well, in verse 13 to 15, James makes it patently clear because his listeners would have picked up, okay, now this word is shifting. The nuance in verses 13 to 15 is that of an inner enticement to sin. And in the first part of James, the nuance is on external circumstances, events, that refine our faith. So take a look at this chart. I think it's really helpful in looking at testing versus temptation. So you can understand the difference, even though it's the same Greek word, because this will help us as we face temptation. So testing, in the first half of the chapter, that seeks to reveal the person's moral qualities or character and move them into conformity with Christ. Whereas temptation deceives and persuades to evil so that it may corrupt and ruin us. Testing tests our faith, but the motive is that we would pass, that we would flourish as a result. Temptation, on the other hand, wants to see us fail and fall, so it destroys faith. Testing seeks to undeceive us. In other words, we can have all sorts of self-deception, and then when things happen in our life, we suddenly are undeceived. We realize, Lord, I thought that you were my all. Lord, I thought I was following you, and now look how quickly I'm turning my back. Look how quickly I'm fearing. Look how quickly I'm worrying. So testing exposes to us what's in our hearts. Temptation seeks to do the opposite, to deceive us, to lure us. Testing focuses more on the external. There's external pressures, and temptation works more internally. 
Testing aims at the person's good, making him more aware of his need for God and God's glorious ability to supply all his needs. And temptation aims at leading the person consciously or unconsciously into increasing independence. Independence and separation from God and his revealed will. Testing is the work of God and temptation is the result of the world, the flesh and the devil. And we're going to be focusing on the flesh the next two weeks. Testing, if you endure it, leads to maturity and growth and refinement. Temptation, if not resisted, leads to death. So I want us to see that God may use trials to test us, but God never tempts us. Every trial has the potential to become a temptation, but then we can't blame God for the temptation. See this hinge in verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And the reason why this verse is the hinge is because you could put trial or temptation in verse 12. And James says we'll be blessed, we'll be happy, we'll be joyful, we'll know deep fulfillment, a deep satisfaction if we choose to honor God, love God more than whatever temptation is promising us. You know, making it through trials and temptations is about God's glory and our blessing. And I think we sometimes look at all these things, uh, Christianity can seem to people like just a whole lot of rules and do's and don'ts, but ultimately it's for our blessing, it's for our good, it's for our, our joy. And we, we all know people that have succumbed to certain temptations and it's destroyed their lives. And James says, this crown of eternal life is promised to those who love him. It's about relationship. It's not just saying, oh, I broke God's command. I shouldn't break commandments as though there's this impersonal lawgiver. This is your father. You break his heart. This is about relationship. This language here that James is using is, is, is relational. And the only way you'll resist temptation is if you love God more than you love sin. So James comes now, having dealt with tests in the first half of the chapter, he now predicts what we, his readers, and his original listeners would have said. Here it is, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. So when temptation comes knocking on your door, there are four things that James wants you to do. And we're only going to look at two this week, and God willing, two next week. The first one is when temptation comes knocking at your door, don't blame God. Don't blame God because this is actually the real temptation. It's that we would blame God when we face temptation. Think of some of the things we might say, God, you're the one that brought me into this situation. God, you allowed this thing in my life to happen. God, you made me this way. God, if you didn't answer my prayer in that area, so why should I honor you now? Lord, it's your fault that I'm doubting because you never answered that prayer. You know, if God had stopped this, then I wouldn't have made a mess of my life. You know, and then we blame other people. If, if my spouse was just more stable, then. If my parents had only been more, well then. You know, if my kids just did, then. You know, if my life could be less stressful, then I'd be able to. You see, this is the blame game, and it's been played since the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve blamed God. Yes, they blamed each other, but ultimately they were implying, God, it's your fault. So once they'd given into temptation, eaten that forbidden fruit, they implied, God, you're the one that created this fruit. You're the one that put it on a tree. You're the one that put this tree in the middle of the garden. If you didn't want us to, to touch it or be tempted by it, it could have vanished. And Adam said, God, you're the one that gave me this woman, Eve. You created her. She's the one that enticed me. Let me off the hook. And Eve, God, you're the one that made the serpent. It's God's fault. And you know what blaming God does? It just makes you bitter. It makes you angry. And I think of how many people over the years that I've journeyed with or seen who've just deeply angry with God, that there's something that happened and they can't get past that. And maybe that's you here today. I want to encourage you, don't, don't stay there. That's where the tempter wants to keep you, blaming God and just fostering a bitterness that's just going to destroy your soul. 
Like Adam and Eve, if the tempter can get you to doubt God's goodness, then half the battle's won. That's what he was doing. We, we covered that end of November. You know, Adam and Eve, God's holding out on you. He's not a good God. He's stingy. He's tight-fisted. That's why he's given you all these trees, all this fruit, but not this one. Why, why is he keeping that from you? They don't notice all that God's given. They notice what he hasn't given. And so they fall. And Satan knows that this particular fruit is good for food, pleasing to the eyes, desirable for gaining wisdom. And now that they've thought God is stingy and not good, and this looks so amazing, munch. Now imagine if you're planning on running the comrades, besides being a little bit mad, but I know there are some of you. Um, if you were planning on running the comrades and you employed an endurance coach, and you went to the coach and said like, you know, I've got a year to go to comrades, uh, you know, I want to really build my endurance, then that coach would, would begin with a program. They'd sign some exercises, and in some sense, it's a test. It's a test of your endurance, but what's his motive? His motive is to see you flourish. It's to uh, show you areas where you can improve and hone your skills and develop your endurance. And so the test is ultimately for your long-term good. Short term, you might say, oh, maybe I don't actually want to run the comrade. So short term, it can, can feel like this is just so difficult, so painful. But long term, his motive is good. So that's a test. Now, if you decide halfway through this program or halfway through one of the exercises that you're giving up and you're hitting McDonald's for five McFeast combos, then that test has become a temptation. So can you see the difference? Here, there's a good, but you are responsible for quitting. And so when you felt that wrestle, ah, I wanna quit, I wanna quit, that test has now in your life become a temptation if you give into it. So can you really blame the coach that you gave into temptation? Tim Keller is so helpful here. In a sermon, he talks about cause and occasion. He says there's a big difference between the cause and the occasion of temptation. The occasion is the test, but the cause is your own desire. And then he gives this illustration. For example, an algebra teacher gives a test. Hands up all the maths teachers. All right, you're about to go down. Um, <laughs> Keller says the purpose of this test is to show you what's in the heart. But if the student hasn't learned the material, the test doesn't cause the student's failure. So you haven't got down yet. The teachers are agreeing. It's the lack of discipline. It's the lack of knowledge. It's the too much gaming. The test is the occasion for the failure, not the cause of the failure. And then Keller said the student could easily say, and here you're going down, if that stupid algebra teacher hadn't tested me, I wouldn't have failed, wouldn't have got an F. And Keller says you can make a mistake, a very self-justifying one in which you mistake the occasion for the cause. So I trust that that's helpful and that's clear to you as you, as you, as you think about where you are in your life with external pressures and, and trials and tests and then on this side, the fact that some of them can become temptations. And so James is at pains in verse 13 again. He says, when tempted, not if you're tempted, it's a guarantee. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. Why? For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. When it says God cannot be tempted, we said the, the, the word for temptation is perasmos. When it says God is untemptable, it just puts an A in front. It makes that whole word negative. So, Here's temptation, but God is a perastos. He is untemptable. It's impossible to tempt him to evil, and therefore, he doesn't tempt anyone. So James is not going to let us off the hook and allow us to shift the blame onto God. He's emphatic. God never is orchestrating the downfall of his children. Never. He has no desire to see you fail or fall. He desires to see you flourish. He desires to see you blessed as James said, like the Sermon on the Mount, blessed is the man, or like Psalm 1, blessed is the man. It's, it's everywhere. So what do we do now? Where do we put the blame then? On Satan 
Well, Satan certainly plays a role, and that could be another whole separate sermon. But here, James puts the responsibility somewhere else. Because even Satan can't get you to do what you don't desire to do. So verse 14, James says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own, <coughs> excuse me, by their own evil desire and enticed. So what do you do when temptation comes knocking? Number one, you don't blame God. And number two, you have to focus inward. You have to examine your own heart. Examine what kind of desires you have in your heart. Because you can't blame God. Temptation would have no effect on you if there wasn't something already within you, some kind of desire that it could appeal to. I mean, think about it. If you were a creature that didn't need to eat and didn't have the desire of hunger, I could bring all sorts of things before you and you'd say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? It, it has no appeal to you. It's not going to cause you to stumble. So I want to read you what Albert Barnes says, and I've got quite a few quotes today because some of the old Puritans really had such a great grasp and used such picturesque language to understand temptation. And Albert Barnes, I think he lived in the 1800s, said, the fountain or source of all temptation is in man himself. It's true that external inducements to sin may be placed before him, but they would have no force if there's not something in himself to which they corresponded and over which they might have power. There must be some lust, some desire, some inclination, something which is unsatisfied now, which has made the foundation of the temptation and which gives it all its power. If there were no capacity for receiving food or desire for it, objects placed before us appealing to the appetite could never be made a source of temptation. Matthew Henry says, in other scriptures, the devil is called the tempter and other things may sometimes concur to tempt us, but neither the devil nor any other person or thing is to be blamed so as to excuse ourselves. For the true origin of evil and temptation is in our own hearts. The combustible matter is in us, though the flame may be blown up by some outward causes. That's profound. This combustible matter is within us. And the more combustible matter, the bigger the fire. And we all have different combustible matter. But we can't blame God. We have to look inwards. And Proverbs 19 verse 3 makes this point well. A man's own folly ruins his life. Yet his heart rages against the Lord. And isn't that the irony? We lead ourselves astray at times and yet at the same time want to blame God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, you know, if birds are flying over your head, there's not much you can do about that. But if they begin to nest in your hair, there's a problem. So temptation is there. You can't stop yourself necessarily from, from seeing something, whether it's a billboard or, or, or being drawn somewhere. But you certainly can stop that thing, that bird of temptation from making a, a nest in your hair. So examine your heart, the combustible matter is in you. And when James says each person, he's saying none of us are the same. That combustible matter in you is not the same combustible matter in me. I mean, as I think back, I don't think I've ever been tempted to shoplift. That's not to say I might not be tempted in the future. I've never been tempted to sleep with another man. But we're all different. And temptation knows how to target us. Because ultimately Satan lies behind that the wiles of the devil. I mean, he, he, he's got those arrows that he wants to fire at us. Temptation has to correspond with something within us. And so we need to reflect on our past, our personalities, our temperaments, the way we were brought up, our past sin, things that we exposed ourselves to when we were younger. All of those things shape us. And all it takes is that little spark, that little flame, and the combustible matter goes up. I think one of the snares of pornography is that it can only satisfy so much. And like most sins, there's always a slippery slope. You could have this amount, and then it doesn't kind of give you that fix, and then you need more, and it needs to be more extreme, and so it goes. And do you realize you're feeding the desires, you're feeding this monster on your back, and eventually you don't know who's feeding who. The message paraphrase translation of this verse says, 
the temptation to give in to evil comes from us and only us. We have no one to blame but the leering, seducing flare-up of our own lust. Thomas Boston, an old Puritan, once said, Observe your hearts at all times, but especially under temptation. Temptation is a fire, there's the word again, a fire that brings up the scum of the vile heart. Temptation is like a sly con artist. And I remember enjoying watching that British TV series called Hustle. I think there were like seven or eight seasons of these grifters who do these long cons and they try and find the mark and they've got various things and they'll just like rent a building and turn it into some office. And they, they say you can't tempt an honest man. So all these people are already greedy so then when they get caught, they won't report it to the police. It's just, it's actually a genius show to watch to see how temptation actually work so that you can equip yourself against it. So what are your vulnerability factors? Con artists always target the vulnerable. What are your vulnerability factors? Have you thought about it? What are my fatal flaws? What is the chink in my armor? What is my Achilles heel? What's my hidden, hidden weakness? Or for some of you superheroes out there, what's my kryptonite? I mean, if you were to fall into sin and make a, a, a rotten mess of your life or your marriage or your parenting or your business, if you were to fall into sin, what area would it be? I think, I think we all have an idea of what it, what it would be. Would it be money? Maybe say, that's not my issue, but my issue is power. I, I can feel it. I can sense it. Or is it sex? We'd fall sexually or morally. Is it greed? Is it impatience? Overspending, rudeness or selfishness or jealousy that just consumes us or gossip or lying or cheating or plagiarism or revenge. We just can't let this go. We've got to have the revenge, this volatile temper. The list is as diverse as our combustible matters. And God's word tells us in Genesis 4 and verse 7, sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Sin is like a, a criminal hiding at home behind the door. And as you come in there, if you're not aware, you're about to get strangled. See, it's our own evil desires that drag us away and entice us to sin. But I want us to see something else this morning from understanding what this word means in the original language. So between Richard and I, you should be able to speak Greek by now. But I actually don't like the NIV translation. So Richard will be glad to hear that because he likes the ESV and I don't normally give it a thumbs up, but the ESV is better here. Um, the NIV translates this evil desire, but the word evil is actually not in the Greek at all. Yes, they were right to put it in to help us to understand the context of what's going on. But the Greek just says desire. We led away by our desires. And the word desire is itself a neutral word. So we often think, okay, it, it has negative connotations. But yes, in English, lust generally has negative connotations. But if you think about it, lust and desire can be positive or negative. I mean, here's Luke 22, verse 15, the same word Jesus speaks. Jesus says to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And the Greek literally says, with desire, I have desired. It's almost like the words repeated twice. Desire, desire, that's how much. So what makes a desire, good or bad, is the object of that desire. Desire simply means whatever you set your heart upon, whatever is consuming you, whatever you're longing after, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're worshiping, whatever you're serving, whatever's consuming your imagination, whatever you're prepared to, to put money on. And that could be a desire for God or a desire for sin. So the point here is that we mustn't mistake desires for being automatically evil. Our desires were given to us by God. 
And without these kind of desires, we couldn't function. Unless you felt hunger and thirst, you'd never eat and drink and you'd die. Without fatigue, the body would never rest and would eventually wear out. Sex is a normal God-given desire. Without it, the human race would have been wiped out. It wouldn't continue. But it's when we satisfy those desires in ways outside of God's will, outside of his plan, that we get into trouble. So I just want you to see that our desires are not inherently sinful, but our desires have become disordered as a result of the fall. We love what we should hate, and we hate what we should love. So let's look at this Greek word, desire. It's the Greek word epithumia. And the root word, if we go back to the root, the kind of the thumia part, there's like a, a root meaning under that. It means to burn, to burn. In other words, you could think why it's been translated desire. So the link is even here. The more combustible the matter, the greater the fire. And then James uses an intensified version of that root word. He says epithumia, that's the word he uses here. Epi means over. So our hearts drag us away because of over desire, because of epi desire. If you think about what, what is the epicenter of something, it's not just the center, it's like the pinpoint center uh, of, of, of mass destruction. It's like the exact point of intensity. I mean, even the prodigal son, the same Greek word is used, that he epi-desired the food that the pigs were eating. I mean, you can see, you can sense how strong that desire must have been. Eating is normal, but gluttony is an epi-desire. It's sin. Sleep is normal, I hope, for most of you. But it is, it's a, it's a normal desire, but laziness, that's the epi-desire of sleep. Or what about sex? Sex within marriage is beautiful, but sex outside of marriage is an epi-desire. It's an over-desire. And so we just need to understand that we're always in danger of taking what God has made good and corrupting it. And so sin is not just bad things. Sin can actually also be good things. But things that we want too much, things that replace God, things that are substitutes, Sin is something that you add to Jesus Christ to be happy. Very few of us would say, well, Lord, we don't want you anymore, and we're going after this. It's like, hmm, can't we have God and this stuff? I mean, I come to church, I pray, God is nice, Jesus is nice, but if I don't have this, I don't have life. And so we crave this with an epi-desire. C.S. Lewis, who I love, and you'll see, I quote him a few times as we bring things to a close. C.S. Lewis is human history. It's the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. And then C.S. Lewis in another book called The Screwtape Letters, and maybe some of you are familiar with that, but The Screwtape Letters are 31 letters, obviously written by Lewis, but in a satirical way. It's written from a chief head demon called Screwtape, to a young, experienced demon, his nephew called Wormwood. So I want you to just kind of picture this. Lewis wrote this so that we as Christians could understand what goes on behind the scenes in terms of the evil that lies behind temptation and how Satan wants to trip us up. So this is from their perspective. This is his training in how to tempt us. Screwtape says to Wormwood, never forget then when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are in a sense on the enemy's ground, enemy referring to God. So you see what he's saying there? He's saying God's actually given these people great things, good things, pleasures that are healthy and normal and satisfying. Then he goes on and says, all the same, it's his invention, God's, not ours. So they're saying we could never think of something this good. So what can we do? All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy God has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden, an ever increasing craving for an ever diminishing pleasure is the formula. Do you see how 
satanically subtle and brilliant that is. They didn't come up with these desires. Those were God's good intentions. But if they can get us to corrupt them, then they've won the day. So what do we do with this desire? I don't know about you, but, but God's given us mammoth desires. I mean, did God give us these desires as some kind of cruel trick? So it gives us all these desires, but then we, we yearning for what can actually never be found? No. No. Even Satan zeroed in on human desire, and he, the, the desire for pleasure and wisdom and temptation, and he said, eat the forbidden fruit and you, your desires will be satisfied, and it was a lie. Those desires were not satisfied. And the rest, as they say, is history. And every time we give in to, to false desires, to evil desires, our lives are cheapened. Sin always comes with a price tag. And even though you might look at this, it's like the price tags have been switched. And this, what looks cheap is now expensive. And what's expensive is now cheap. So what do we do with our desires? Where do we look if, if we sense that there's nothing on earth that can truly satisfy our souls? We have to look beyond earth. We have to look at God, we have to look at Christ. Don't you think that the reason why God made the universe so amazingly big and, and every time there's a new discovery as you've seen in the past few months, we realize things are bigger. Why? To show us I'm bigger than that. Why has God given us such big desires? Because only he can satisfy our souls. Only he. Only in him can we be truly fulfilled. There was an old commentator that said that if man is merely a natural being, in other words, there's no supernatural, we just, you know, natural beings, we don't have any spirit or soul, then he says, we're just the highest of animals. That's really, we're all animals, yeah, we could maybe say, okay, we're a little bit higher in the food chain. But then this old commentator says, why does nature not satisfy human beings. Why is the eye not satisfied with seeing? Why is the ear not satisfied with hearing? He says the mere animal is easily satisfied and returns into its rest. If you've seen animals, once they've eaten their food, they, they're able to relax and enter their rest. And then he says, how different with man? So if we're supposed to be animals, then we should be just as content as they are, but we're not. He says, Man's bodily comforts may be everyone attended to, his senses filled with grateful pleasures, his imagination fed with the most gorgeous images of beauty, his intellect stored with the facts and laws of every department of science, but all does not slake the thirst of his spirit. His soul still cries, give, give, no, I don't want this, I don't want this, give me living water of which if a man drink, he'll never thirst again. The reason why Jesus is the bread of life and the living water is because nothing else will truly satisfy us. So here's my last quote from Lewis again, but man, I love Lewis and uh, just the imagery he paints. He says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. He says, a baby feels hunger. Well. There's such a thing as food. He says, a duckling wants to swim, so there's such a thing as water. He says, sex, men feel sexual desire, well, there's such a thing as sex. And then he says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can truly satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. That was he saying, all these things that attract us, we weren't meant to be attracted, we, we were meant to see these deep desires that can only be found in Christ. And so he says, if that's so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise and be unthankful for these earthly blessings, so we shouldn't just push them aside, they're good gifts. But on the other side, never to mistake them for something else of which they're only a kind of copy, echo, or mirage. They are the scent of a flower we have not found, 
the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. So let's look forward to that day when we'll be in that final country and even now we can experience God's joy and grace. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and as we close, I want to read a few verses from the book of Hebrews and just allow God's word to speak to you as we come to look at Christ, as we reflect on him. Hebrews tells us, because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Well, what do we do when temptation comes knocking? Number one, we refuse to blame God. And number two, we need to examine our own heart desires. So I wanna invite and encourage you to join us next week for part two. James does an incredible expose of how temptation works, how it starts, how it progresses, where it ends up. Gives us five stages of, of where temptation drags us down the slippery slope and we can stop it at any point. But the highlight, the highlight of next week is some amazing imagery that James uses so that our love for God would be rekindled and would produce this just this fresh desire to love God more than anything else. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for the practicality of your word. I thank you that this morning we can just take this slow pace, just think and reflect and meditate. I pray, Lord, that you would soften our hard hearts, that you would remind us, Lord, that that when we've experienced grace and we continue to abuse that grace, that Lord, we, we're actually abusing the love of a father who loves us more than we could ever imagine. Lord, I just pray that you would arrest our souls again. Lord, we're frail, we're mortal. The psalmist tells us that we dust. Lord, we have feet of clay. Lord, we can fall at any moment. We are not as confident as we like to think we are. And I just ask that he who began a good work will bring it to completion, that you would keep us in the gospel, that you would enable us to persevere, Lord. We know that's a mystery, Lord, that, that is God who wills and acts in you. And so, Lord, even as we persevere, it's you behind the scenes enabling that. So I just pray, Lord, that we would see the deception of sin and we would see the beauty of Christ. And Lord, we'd long to be more like him and that we'd see progress in our lives, not towards death, but towards life. Because we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.